Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crypto News Podcast. We're buzzing as always. It's your host, Matt Sehab. And today, 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 we have Jason Guthrie on the Crypto News Pod. He's the head of a digital asset product for Wisdom Tree in Europe. Guthrie oversees Wisdom Tree's digital asset efforts, which include bringing new products to market, identifying opportunities to enhance existing products, driving distribution strategies, and leading client education and engagement on cryptocurrencies. Previously, Jason was head of capital markets for Wisdom Tree in Europe for four years, where his team was responsible for ensuring clients had a smooth trade execution experience. Prior to joining Wisdom Tree, Jason worked at Deutsche Bank's ETF Capital Markets Group, as well as Macquarie Bank as an investment executive based in Sydney, Australia. Jason also holds a Bachelor of Commerce Finance from Macquarie University in Sydney. I think I butchered Macquarie, but hey, <laughs> Macquarie, well, Macquarie, you're very close. there we go. Nonetheless, without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Jason Guthrie to the Crypto News Podcast. Jason, welcome to the show, my friend. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me. Pumped to have you on. My apologies on the butchering. Uh, I've actually never even heard of that. Never. It's a bit of a weird one. Almost has like a little French cling to it. It's uh, it's named for one of the first governors of Australia when the uh, British founded it as a colony back in the day. Boom. I'll get them next time. You can't win them all. Jason, the big news that is out and about this week, which will most likely dominate the Q4 news cycle in crypto. I don't think anything will be bigger than this. The two biggest exchanges have joined and are forming one. We don't know what it's going to be, but the news just came across the wire. Binance is acquiring FTX, all of FTX, not just FTX US, all of FTX. SBF, who sort of shot on other institutions and other exchanges for being insolvent is now part of the insolvency parade. How bananas is this? And what does this mean for the crypto industry as a whole? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really big deal. Um, I think, you know, what we've seen to date has been, not to say it's not big deals, but relatively fringe kind of players in, in, in the space have been acutely affected by this, right? Terra Luna is a relatively new coin and pretty experimental for algorithmic stable coins ends up going under, okay? Um, we have, you know, retail brokers in Voyo, we have a very leveraged lender in Celsius, but, you know, the guys that kind of seemed like more adults in the room were the people that had been running exchanges for a very long time, established businesses and cash flows and this sort of stuff. So to see these guys merging and, you know, a, a very major consolidation under, you know, rumors of, of kind of this liquidation potential around SBF's businesses, um, that, that, that's really big news. Um, consolidating these two guys in the space. I mean, look, for, for a lot of what goes on out there, Binance and FTX have been the innovators over the last kind of couple of years, um, at least within the trading and execution space. So, you know, it's interesting to see that they're trying to come together. Does that make them some sort of, you know, big powerhouse or is this, you know, going to constrain the way that the space operates going forward? We're going to have to see how this unfolds. But very, very interesting stuff. Is it, like, my first initial thought was, Binance already has so much control over everything and FTX was really its only competitor. More specifically, its only competitor on North American soil. Um, excuse my ignorance. I don't even know who the biggest exchange is in Europe. I, I, it's probably Bitpanda or someone of the like, but on on the North American soil side of things, it's really just FTX and Coinbase. Coinbase, you know, after they went public, there's so many rules and regulations they need to follow. They can't really move and groove, but it just seems like China has such a stronghold now with you know, Huobi with Binance, um, and there's so many others too. But like, I can't see this being a good thing moving forward. Yeah, I, I do worry about the competition side of things. I, I think that that's a very reasonable kind of thing to be concerned with here. I They also run very different businesses, and I don't necessarily like to see that disappearing from the market. But Binance is a relatively big, sprawling organization. FTX has always remained you know, pretty lean and focused on where they thought they could add value and, and really trying to go into that in a clever way. I One of the talking points that you always heard, heard uh, SBF talking about is that they do this with like an order of magnitude less employees than anyone else in the space. Like three or 400 people or something work for um, FTX and it's like 5,000 at Coinbase, right? Um, so it was always really impressive that they were running the business in that very different way. So I, I don't like to see that exit the market. It, it is sort of a somewhat of a uh, you know consolidation toward this big monolithic exchange model and I don't I don't think that's particularly healthy at this stage I want to see us continuing to building and trying different business models and, and innovating and growing do we 
Jason, do we know exactly why FTX needed this bailout? Like, I know obviously there was a big conundrum in regards to users not being able to withdraw their funds, but was there a specific event in particular besides crypto getting dunked on and besides the price of many of their assets, you know, having or, or losing 80% of its value? What was that sort of catalyst that, that made that last domino fall? I haven't seen anything conclusive coming through. Like, as you say, this is still breaking news and it's still unfolding. So we're going to have to, to kind of look at it. Um, you know, there, there is sort of con- some conjecture around the, like the quality of the assets that they were buying. Yes, like they've been on this buying spree, right, with all the kind of distressed assets and companies over the last kind of several months. Um, that's going to take a toll on your balance sheet. So right. I think it's going to be interesting as details come out about, you know, well, did they buy some things that they thought were savageable that is just turning out that they're not? Um, and, and how do they, they aggregate? What does that balance sheet look like? What do those assets look like? But I think we're going to need to wait wait for that one to unfold. It does feel like it's a bit early to, to pin it on one thing. I bet SBF definitely regrets buying like BlockFi and all those distressed companies. And again, it's like I never really totally understood his rationale behind that. I It, it didn't seem like they were good investments. Yes, they got them at an extreme discount, but there's a reason why they got them at an extreme discount. It almost seems like he wanted to put on his like, you know, Robin Hood sort of cape and... and and do his own thing and just gallivant and 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 sort of be a hero. Like, am, am I out of line there? No, I don't think so. I, look, the, the the cynical view is that, um, you know, it, it wasn't altruism. It was designed to prop the crypto space up, right? Like, if they emerge being strong and people have still got faith in it because there were less bankruptcies and more people got their money back, then they're going to profit from the bull run that follows on from that, right? Um, maybe it was, you know, as you say, more of a Robin Hood, type thing and he felt compelled to save it out of the fact that he that he really likes it but you know in either way it didn't necessarily seem like everything was a was a sound financial investment right um to a degree i think we've if you're going to be in the space you need to accept that it is early right and that there is going to be creative destruction cycle people are going to try new things those things are going to fail they're going to go bust and if it's not working probably needs to leave the ecosystem to have a stronger one at the end of it Crazy, crazy times, man. And and one of my favorite parts about these crazy times, and I talk about this all the time on the pod, and to the listeners, my apologies if we beat the Twitter dead horse a little too much, but never in our lives have multi-billion dollar acquisitions happened. And before it goes live on a legit newswire and PR teams get to blast it out and lawyers sign docs, you have these founders, these billionaires just going crazy on Twitter. Like it's it's pretty bananas seeing how the news wire breaks down. Like I guess relating that to a company like yourself at Wisdom Tree, a multi billion dollar you know tradfi company, I, that just wouldn't happen. Like your your CEO would not just let it fly you know, right off right off the bat. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean the PR comms for established companies for listed companies, it, it's very very locked down. Um, I guess we are in a bit of a unique situation where we do have these very big, very influential private companies. But, you know, even for the, the private guys in the traditional space, in, in finance, like if you think about Bloomberg is a really good example of, you know, a big, influential, powerful, but private company doesn't act like this. So it is this, you, it's almost like internet culture being injected into big business. It's, uh, it's interesting times. Let's, let's keep buzzing on Wisdom Tree for a little bit. A lot of people in North America, at least myself included, until I did research for this, I've always heard of Wisdom Tree. I didn't know how big you guys really were. Before we really get into it and how you guys are moving and grooving in crypto, can you just let me know how freaking big the company is and how much you guys have, you know, assets under management, the AUM? Because it is freaking absolutely massive. Yes. So we run about $80 billion, depending on on where the market, I think we're down, at, we're about 75 actually now, given market moves. So we run about $75 billion. Um, we're very active in both North America, in the US and in Europe. Um, we have about 280 people globally. So yeah, that's those are some pretty big numbers right there. And the reason why you're on the pod is you are running up the digital asset book, boutique, strategy, whatever you want to call it, over at Wisdom Tree. Seems like a lot of TradFi, massive traditional finance institutions are getting into the space. Many of them have different strategies. How are you guys sort of paving your way into this? And, and what strategies are you using to really make a name for yourself in the space? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, you're right. Like a lot of people are now looking at this. I think it's every other week you get 
a, a news article about, you know, if it's BlackRock or JP Morgan or whoever is 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 looking at entering the space. But I think there is, you know, a relative spectrum in terms of how how people are looking. It's a lot of guys are coming to the realization that, you know, crypto is a real asset class. This has been around for 11, 12 years, that this is here to stay and it's something that they, they kind of need to take seriously. Others are coming at it from, hey, you know, can we use blockchain to, to maybe simplify some of our automation stuff and looking at kind of internally. Um, where we're coming at this from is we, we believe that blockchain native financial services and crypto is going to form a part of that, I believe, but blockchain native financial services is going to disrupt the industry wholesale. Right, and that we need to start uh, positioning our business and building kind of solutions and products for clients that help them take advantage of, of that and help them to live more and more of their financial lives uh, in that blockchain native ecosystem. So we end up with sort of a twofold strategy here. One, it's you know trying to bring uh, traditional assets and financial services on chain, as well as making crypto more available to to the general public. And we think there's a symbiosis between those two activities as people become more aware of familiar of one, they're more interested and active in the other. How do you how do you do those two? How do you bring traditional assets on chain? Of course there's, you know, a couple very in your face methods and I'm sure there's a ton of under the table methods as well. And sort of a caveat to this question I have for you is I'm a big believer that and again, this is no original thinking. There's no way I could take the credit for this. I've stole this from people hundreds of times smarter than me. But I'm a big believer that almost every single asset will be tokenized and will be digitized at some point, right? Where it can be literally anything that we'd ever imagined, cars, insurance, you name it, where it will be tradable, right? And I also believe that you'll be able to go to, you know, your everyday grocery store and buy a pint of milk or or a pint of, you know, or six pack of pints with wisdom tree stock or Apple stock or whatever. Um, and I don't think we're too far out from that, but Walk me, th- walk me through the, the sort of the whole process and strategy of bringing traditional assets on chain, which therein makes crypto more accessible to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the the kind of starting point for a lot of this is is to really look at it as, you know, an, an alternative ownership certificate, right? That's kind of tokenization. It's basic for like really if to use the technical terms, like dematerialized ownership is nothing new, right? The idea that there was an asset held securely in one location that you got a reference of that ownership that was more tradable, right? If you think about a paper certificate for um, like a bar of gold that you have stored in a vault, that was a dematerialized thing. Now that's evolved and evolved and evolved over time. And the next evolution of that is blockchain native and, and tokenization. And that's because it just comes with a whole bunch of functionality that you don't get in, you know, the equities market or in the bond market or, or anything else up there today in terms of like native peer-to-peer, much more control and transparency. Um, much more transferability, so sort of features that we know add a lot of value. So this is kind of the, the very starting way to approach it is, is to just think about it like it's an ownership certificate, run it like an asset management product um, and make it available to people in that ecosystem. The best example of people doing things like this are the stablecoin providers, right? Um, the fully backed ones anyway, right? So where you've got the reserve of the cash held in a traditional bank account and a, and a reference of, of you know, those dollar holdings that people can then utilize in some way, shape or form. So the practices for running programs like that, super well established, right? It's a big reason that Wisdom Tree is able to step into this space um, is because, you know, running those pools of assets, that's what we do all day long. As I said, we run about $80 billion of product in that way today. And so bringing these concepts, bringing these press practices and putting them on chain is by far the easiest way to start to, to bring things to market. So we can look at, you know, commodities like gold is a great example. Um, we're working on a project around tokenizing gold. Uh, we've also just got approval from the SEC to do a tokenized treasury fund. So this is where we can have like a pool of US government bonds and make it available in a single token uh, on chain and allow people to trade that. So again, it's just following patterns and concepts that have existed in asset management and financial services for a very long time, dematerialized ownership using on-chain record being a token as the, that reference for ownership, right? This can evolve a long way from there. That's definitely the starting point because this is where you can create a nexus between what exists, works well, best practice today and this new functionality that you that you get from, from tokenization. It can definitely evolve beyond this, right? Native issuance of assets onto uh, blockchain is going to come. There's a lot of projects out there around Bond issuance is where people are starting, but people issuing equity natively, as opposed to going, say, doing your IPO on the NASDAQ or NICE right. or wherever, 
they might actually issue it, you know, directly onto chain and trade it on Coinbase or Binance. I think FTX, you know, I'm sorry, FTX is obviously merging with Binance now, but like people have been looking at like that tokenized security direct issuance for a little while now. And I know the traditional exchanges are looking to get into it as well. So that's where you lose some intermediaries and, and do that directly. And then there's sort of the evolution of how people think about value and what could actually be held as part of a tokenized holding. And you mentioned a few kind of uh, things in your intro there. I think it can go, you know, you can really expand the idea of value from beyond something tangible or an investment to something that you use as part of that kind of digital financial life. So if I think about your mortgage, the deed to your house is, is somewhat of an obvious one. People have talked about real estate, but how about your credit score? How about your healthcare or your employment benefits? Things that would benefit from more transparency, more control, more transferability. These would actually be other really powerful parts of value that interact with people's financial lives that I think would benefit from kind of tokenization as well. But as I say, I think where we start is creating the nexus between you know, this big financial real world asset ecosystem that exists today and the tokenized one, thinking about it like it's a, the next evolution in dematerialized ownership. I think once, again, like a traditional Apple stock or gold or a lot of these assets do, no mind you, an Apple stock, no one actually trades like the freaking paper slips for an Apple stock anymore. But right. once it becomes tokenized and digitized and is sort of quantified as crypto or part of blockchain technology, I think that's when the gen pop will really sort of not be as, you know, gray-eyed about things. You know what I mean? I feel like that's when they'll be like, oh, this ac- this technology can actually be used for assets that we understand and that we believe are for the greater good and can, you know, help us make some money. And, and I think that will that will really sort of kick off a good thing. But w- one of the things I want to ask, Jason, and you brought up a really good point about bonds. You're not the first person who's told me about this. And I never really took a deep dive in, but why are, why are people so horny about tokenizing and digitizing bonds right now? They've become a much more interesting, I think, instrument recently. There's, there's a few reasons, right? Like, uh, but a lot of, they're one of the most liquid, most traded assets in the world, right? The amount of government debt, it's also one of the lowest risk ones. And it's something that people look to for generating a yield. It's, isn't, it, um, isn't it the biggest asset class in the world? Yeah. Yeah, bonds, yes. right. It's crazy, it it's crazy to think of that because like, I, like I don't, I've never traded one. It's like, I feel like most people have never touched them in their whole lives and it's the biggest asset class in the world. <laughs> so, I mean, it, everyone's heard of like, the government debt, it's a, it's a constant talking point yeah. in the US, right? Yeah. They're raising the debt ceiling or, you know, the, the national debt's up to X, Y, Z. That debt is raised through bond issuance. So for every dollar that you see in national debt in the US, there's a bond out there that is purchasable and tradable. That's, the, that's, that's where that comes from. And it's huge. So everybody would have heard of it. They might not have quite connected it to bonds. Interesting. I, lo- I, I forget the name of the Twitter account. There's one Twitter account. It, it might be Zero Hedge or something like that. And every like two weeks, there's like a, Fed institu- or Fed releases new bond repo, 1.1 trillion. And it's like taken by 20 counterparties, including, you know, Goldman, JP, uh, Wisdom Tree, blah, blah. It's crazy. I'm just like, how is there so much money? Anyways, going back to the bonds, why is everyone so keen on digitizing and, uh, and tokenizing all these bonds? Yeah, for sure. Look, so the bond market is actually, you know, pretty sluggish. It would just benefit from the tokenization benefits generally. Um, but I think why we, that's that's sort of like the functional side of things, but you need to find the demand side of things as well, right? There is a moment in markets right now where I think it is a, a much more interesting asset class in that interest rates are up for the first time in a very long time. You can actually generate north of 2% off government debt. That's not something you've been able to do since well before the financial crisis in 08, right? So this is actually suddenly becoming a more interesting asset class. And I think the idea that people could go and get that yield is becoming increasingly interesting. I mean, that's been the narrative in crypto and DeFi for, you know, the last about 18 months or so, was trying to chase this return because it was impossible to get it in the traditional system with with interest rates at zero. No longer the case. But I don't believe that, you know, those that have gone into the, the DeFi, crypto, whatever you want to call it, blockchain native ecosystem actually want to leave. They're now just looking for more opportunities and they want to stay in that space tokenizing this asset class that is historically incredibly low risk, government debt is is, is a very kind of safe haven asset, uh, and allowing them to kind of hold and interact with that and get the benefits of, i.e. the yield uh, inside, that inter- inside that ecosystem is sort of like a savings account alternative, I think is a really compelling idea. Um, and this kind of comes back to the point that you made about like, 
you know, paying for something with a with a stock of Apple, right? It's that compressing of this, you know, sort of the silos that exist in the system today where there's like, you've got your spending stuff over here and you've got your savings here and you've got your investing over here. These can come together and have high functionality and take out some of the middlemen and some of the, the friction and rent seeking that we see in the space. So if you can just go and get that base rate directly from the government, that's much better than what you kind of get in a savings account, right? If you put money in a savings, if you put money in a savings account at a bank, right? Just to give you a really tangible example, if you put it in with JP Morgan with Chase or whatever, um, they might pay you one and a half percent, right? Of of interest on that savings account, and they've then lent it to the government at two and a half, and they just clip the what? Well, why can't we just let people go and put the money it, right. straight in the treasury account? And they can have that one percent. That feels like a better system to me. Would uh, would retail have an impact on the bond market? Like, is there enough? Gunpowder on the retail side to actually move the needle at all, or or at least make a difference. Um, you know, I in the aggregate usage of it, right? Direct investment is is kind of one part. Retail puts their money to work through several kind of avenues, right? Now that might be the money they've got aside for investment, but a much bigger chunk of it comes down through um, pension funds, IRAs, right, right. tax efficient wrappers, this kind of stuff. So retail's uh, indirect investment in it is already huge primarily kind of through their pension funds. I think there's an evolution that can kind of happen there. But if we think about the adoption curve of something like this, the amount of money that you've kind of got sitting there for your savings side of things, that will be kind of the first bit that I think enters the space. So it's it's a meaningful number, but in the aggregate multi-trillion dollar kind of space, short run, probably not. Long run, as kind of more and more of these less direct ways of doing these investments enter that blockchain native world, it, it's, it's absolutely meaningful. It's very few actual investments as investments made are not retail at the end of the day. You know, if it's not IRAs or pension funds or whatever, Good insurance point. and endowments are about the true, you know, independent kind of institutional money, sovereign wealth fund stuff like that. But everyone else is running institutional money at the end of the day. And what we're really talking about here is a reorganization of that system to allow people to just get a bit closer to those investments. Therefore, less middlemen, therefore more for the guy at the end. Very good point there. Folks, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, Jason is going to tell us about Wisdom Trees Prime. But until we do that, got to give a huge shout out to Prime XPT. You guys know I love Prime XPT. Been using them for a hot minute as they offer a robust trading system for both beginners and professional traders that demand highly reliable market data and performance. And Prime XPT also is not going to be going under anytime soon and will not be getting acquired by Binance. Prime XPT is also running an exclusive promo for the listeners of the Crypto News Pod. After making your first deposit, if you use the promo code Crypto News Fifty, you'll receive fifty percent of your deposit credited to your trading account. Again, the promo code is Crypto News Five Zero. That is all one word, Crypto News Fifty, to receive fifty percent of your deposit credited to your trading account. And now back to the show with Jason. Jason, Wisdom Tree Prime. What exactly is that? You guys are moving and grooving in that regard. And me, myself, I looked it up. I am very curious to understand how you guys have partnered with some massive, massive partners like Stride, Galileo, Fireblocks, Securrency. Just lets you do a whole lot within the app, sort of everything you'd want within a digital wallet, really. So tell me more about it and um, what you guys have planned in the future. Yeah, for sure. So uh, as you say, Wisdom Tree Prime is, is sort of the retail-facing, direct-to-consumer mobile wallet that, that we're building here at Wisdom Tree. Um, its sort of mission is to allow people to live more of their, their financial life in a blockchain native way, right? Uh, I think where we kind of separate ourselves out from what, you know, you may have seen with digital wallets in the past is a really high focus on sort of usability and customer service, right? I, I think, you know, a wallet is the right description for it, but I think it falls a little bit short of what we're kind of trying to achieve here, particularly if you compare it to a lot of the self-hosted stuff that is out there. Really what we want to do is provide an experience that lets people hold, interact, invest, pay with digital assets, uh, but in a way that is familiar and comfortable and helps build trust in the space, right? So really we want it to feel like an experience that people have today that they're comfortable with, but all built on top of public infrastructure, blockchain, all built on the top of kind of tokenization. Um, but, you know, for me, this would be, you know, a, a huge success if we can help bring in the next wave of adoption. A lot of people in crypto and they, you know, are perfectly comfortable with MetaMask and browser extensions and managing 20 word seed phrases, but like my mum, never going to do that. And if we want mainstream to come into the space, 
we have to focus on usability and making this stuff easy. And it, it um, has to be through companies like Wisdom Tree. It has to be through reputable multinational finance companies that the average Joe and Josephine can look at the logo and be like, oh, I bank with these guys or, oh, these guys make my money work for me. You know what I mean? It has to be through the traditional players. It has to. Trust is what you're talking about here. And we're at a moment in time in, um, in digital assets in crypto and blockchain where I think trust is at a pretty all-time low, right? Um, the, the bankruptcies that we've seen have been, been damaging Blockfly and uh, Voyager, I think, were the, the really big ones. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, really people misunderstood the kind of risks that were being injected into that company and that they didn't do a good job of educating people on it. So when these things have gone wrong, people feel really betrayed by the space. And I think this is, you know, where we can help to do a much better job. I've talked about kind of bringing best practice from traditional finance into this blockchain native world. We don't need to tear the playbook up entirely, right? There's huge benefits from doing this. And Yes, there's a fringe in, in crypto and blockchain that wants to see the existing system just completely abandoned and it's this free for all of, you know, self-hosted wallets and, you know, not your keys, not your keys, not your coins kind of stuff. But I think the reality is, is, is that you want to take best practice. There's been hundreds of years of financial services and risk management, the right ways to do disclosure and client education, the right ways to run a consumer centric financial services offering. And we want to take all those learnings and all that best practice and inject it into this ecosystem with this new technology that we think can, you know, give consumers an experience that just far outstrips what they get today. Very well said. Is um, Do you think it could happen though? And, and if companies like Wisdom Tree, and, and I know a lot of the big banks and financial institutions are making similar moves that you guys are making, but could it be possible? Could it, could there be a, you know, fully sovereign sort of, decentralized, bankless, be your own bank society? You think that's just a pipe dream or could that happen without the big boys? I think that there is, look, some people are going to want to operate that way and some aren't. I think the most powerful thing that comes from, uh, you know, this much more interconnected, just decentralized ecosystem that we're, that we're trying to participate and build here is that people get more choice, right? And, and that's what's really going to drive us getting to better outcomes and better outcomes as viewed by the end users of, of these, these sort of systems, right? And I think it's very hard to, to sort of generalize for everyone that wants to interact with a financial services system because that is literally everyone on the planet, right? That's 8 billion people. Um, so you can't generalize for them. So people having choice within that system so that it can organically differentiate for them, I think is super, super powerful. Plenty of people live in parts of the world where like you just – can't and shouldn't trust your local financial services system or your government or whatever. If you live in somewhere like Venezuela, like having access to this self-sovereign, universally available, all you need is a smartphone and, and the internet, um, that is really, really, really powerful, right? And I think what is great about the existence of that totally self-sovereign uh, possibility is that it kind of forces everyone else to be honest about it. Like yeah. that's the that's the minimum standard. You've got to do better. So many places right now, they run a pseudo monopoly on on kind of what's going on in that financial services ecosystem because you know it's unique systems or regulation or, or something kind of lets them uh maintain their position. And that doesn't breed a lot of drive in these companies to innovate for the consumer. It drives them to innovate to maintain their place in that ecosystem where they continue to kind of extract rent, right? The, the really egregious example that I like to use um, is Western Union and El Salvador, right? Like everyone makes this big deal about El Salvador investing in uh, Bitcoin and making it legal tender. And a lot of the conversation around that typically focuses on like, was that a good investment or not for the country? But the real story there was like, why would you want to go into a blockchain internet native monetary system to start with? Well, if you dig into it, 30% uh, of the El Salvadorian GDP is from cross-border remittance. Basically, people working in the US sending money home. Um, people in El Salvador live on a few hundred dollars a week. I think it's like $325 Crazy. Crazy. a week, right? Western Union makes $400 million a year off El Salvador on that cross-border remittance. That's just, if you have a much more efficient system that natively allows peer-to-peer, -peer, which is like what Bitcoin blockchain stuff does, 
There's $400 million that can nominally go back into the pockets of people that live on $300 a week. That's literally, that's bananas. Also, right. fuck, and fuck Western Union, scumbag. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can't put them out of business quick enough, right? So this is the sort of innovation that can become more consumer-centric. And then, you know, okay, maybe being self-sovereign is not going to be for everyone because you might be in a country that does have a good regulatory regime that can help build trust and honest companies and trustworthy companies can add value beyond that base. And this is where I think we can get, you know, really interesting stuff. That Western Union stuff with El Salvador is super egregious. But if you think about, you know, what was the, when was the last time you saw a brand new bank come into the market? And if you wonder why, like, your experience with banks pretty much hasn't changed in the last 30 years, um, it's because they've got no reason to innovate. They've got their place. It's a pseudo oligopoly. No one really enters. No one really challenges them. That doesn't change. I talk about like financial services hasn't had its internet moment, right? Yeah, you might get an app from your bank. Yes, you might fill a form in online now that you used to do in uh, that you used to do in paper. But that's really about it. Otherwise, the business model looks exactly the same. If you compare that to what Netflix did to like television or what Spotify did to music, like the business model oh, yeah. fundamentally yes. changes here. Hasn't happened in financial services. Blockchain native offering is what's going to fundamentally change that because if you're much more interconnected and you get a lot more choice, then people need to compete on the things that matter for the end consumer. And that's going to lead us to business models that we haven't thought of yet. But again, it will be much more consumer-centric. And there's tons of examples around where competition, access, breaking down silos lead to better consumer outcomes. It is bananas. <laughs> and your point about the banks are so bang on. Like, I'm a Canadian, right? And there's four or five banks here. They run the show. No one can ever, there's a couple smaller ones that have maybe taken half a percent of market share, right? And that's just on the consumer side, on the retail side, nothing institutionally. But one of my favorite things, and I've asked other friends as well, you know, not looking at their numbers because I don't care about the money they have, just to see the platform they use on banks that I've never used before. When you go into a bank, at least in Canada, all the big five, it's the exact same. When you log on, right, the consumer facing page, before you get into the sort of the nitty gritty where you're making an investment, it's good UX, nothing to write home about, but at least the experience is admirable. And then once you start like clicking around and go to your actual like balance page and jump back and forth, it literally has like 1995 typography with like, it's, it's like, what are you guys doing? You're worth like 60, 70, 80 billion dollars and you can't make a nice consumer looking product. Are you kidding me? It's a, it's, it's bonkers. I generally don't get it. But then again, if I was, you know, if I was a money printer, I probably wouldn't change anything either. Right. It's, I mean, it really is like, if people can't move because there's four of you guys and you all do the same things, then it's not something that you ever lose a customer over. Why would you make it better? And that's what the reality is. Like people need to be able to choose things on the metrics that matter to them. And quite often in financial services, they don't get that choice. They're stuck with kind of what they've got. Like bank, look, having a bank's not optional, right? You need somewhere for your yeah, salary to get deposited. You need a debit card to buy a cup of coffee or, or anything like this or transfer cash for rent, whatever. You have to have it. So they just get that for free. You have to deposit with them. You have to use them. And there's only four and no one enters to compete. So given that those financial services that they offer is like not optional, if you just want to participate in society, they get a free run on getting your deposits. You, again, you're, you're pretty darn high up at Wisdom Tree. What are, and perhaps there's no way you'd bury your own employees. So I know I'm not going to get anything good out of you here, but is there a lot of friction with perhaps some of the older guys and gals with crypto? Like, cause again, I, I know people at Canadian banks who are a little bit older than you and I, and they, they just think it's a complete scam. They don't understand the tech. They're so laissez-faire about it. They don't want to learn about it. Is that a thing at Wisdom Tree? Or, or perhaps are you aware of this being a thing at other financial institutions? It's, um, no, so it's not a thing at Wisdom Tree. Absolutely not. Like the companies uh, embrace it. Now, does that mean everyone is like a crypto evangelist and they, right, right. they want to invest, you know, in the asset class? No. But I think the firm's been really good in sort of its approach. Like crypto as an asset class, we're absolutely going to help people access that asset class and invest it in, in a in sort of a sensible way through sensible products. Uh, and if people want to choose to allocate to that, that's great. That doesn't mean everybody needs to think the investment thesis is great for it. We do things in commodities, bonds, stocks, thematics. It doesn't mean every employee believes in the investment case for all of those at, at every moment in time. Um, but we can see the value that people do want it, that there is a demand and offering good product is, is in line with our services. Distinctly from that, there is sort of the blockchain technology and blockchain-enabled financial services. And what Wisdom Tree's always been really good at 
the reason that we we do ETFs now uh, is because for the last sort of 15, 20 years, that's been the best wrapper, uh, the most consumer centric wrapper, the most consumer focused wrapper that people could go and get exposures in. Right. There's a recognition that like tokenization is the next thing from here. And so, yeah, okay, cool. We do ETFs today, but really what our business is about is offering the best possible product for our clients. This is the direction to travel. This is going to be the product of the future. And so this is what we're building to. It doesn't mean we're walking away from what we're doing. In fact, like it's hugely synergistic. I talked about bringing to bear best practice from the learnings of financial services and learnings of asset management. That's absolutely what we're trying to pipe into tokenization. Right. So there's a synergy there. So it works well. I think where you do get friction in big financial services is where the management view it as a threat or as you say, don't want to learn about it and then think it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, and therefore anything associated with the asset class of crypto is, is therefore worthless. And if you just don't dig deep enough and senior management put that through, that's where it can kind of cause trouble. And I've definitely, you know, heard of and seen that at, at some big institutions, but it's definitely not the case here. In fact, it's the polar opposite. Yeah. I, I love to hear that. Jason, we got a segment on the show called the Hot Take Factory. We jump in and our guest lets a couple hot takes fly. It doesn't need to be crypto or finance related. It can be sports, food, countries, politics, you name it. Anything that you believe in that most other people don't, what do you got for me? Uh, what do I believe in that most other people don't? All right. Uh, Wallabies can win the next World Cup, Rugby World Cup next year. Uh, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, pineapple, pineapple on a pizza is excellent. Don't want to hear a bad word about it. It's basically, Hawaiian pizza is basically the bacon wrapped figs of pizza. Someone find me on Twitter and challenge me otherwise. Um, and if you want a crypto one, I think that getting the next billion people into blockchain financial services uh, is going to require good regulation. And that regulation is going to be a driver of getting this next billion people in as we kind of build trust in the space. Interesting. Number one and three, I definitely agree on. Number two, again, depending depending on the pizza maker, uh, it can either make or break it. But, it, you know, the sweetness along with the saltiness and sort of the tang of the cheese does, it, it can be a good combo. Um, interesting. What about what about habits? I, I'm a, I love learning about people's high performing or habits rather that make them a high performer. Do you have any habits that really get you going? Are you faster? Are you a... No tech, no blue light before bed, 5K a day keeps a doctor away. What, what habits keep Jason buzzing and, and keep making you a high performer? Uh, inter yeah, I do do intermittent fasting, um, typically skip breakfast. Like I do a 16 8 cycle every day. Um, but, you know, not necessarily like routine habits, but I think realizing when you are too deep in a problem or too deep in, a, in an activity and learning to kind of take a step back is something that's, that's always really helped me. So, you know, if I'm trying to crack away at a problem or get a box of work done or we've had a whole bunch of things break in a given day, you know, taking the dog for a walk, stepping away and not thinking about things for half an hour, realizing when you're too deep in it to make progress in that moment, I think is something that's always helped me get to solutions quicker and helped me kind of stay sane as we, uh, as we try to get a lot done. Love it. Great advice. Jason, what a treat, man. Appreciate you coming on the show. Before we let you go, can you please let our listeners know where they can find you, Wisdom Tree, and Wisdom Tree Prime online and on socials? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Twitter, Guthrie Fi, uh, Wisdom Tree Prime, uh, at Wisdom Tree Prime on Twitter as well. Uh, and I would love all the listeners to go and sign up for the Wisdom Tree Prime waitlist uh, that's available now. So wisdomtreeprime.com, just put your email address in and we'll, we'll ping you as we open up. We should be, uh, you know, ready for a, a full US 52 state launch. Uh, hopefully early next year. So, you know, waitlist is available now. Please sign up. Love it. Any any Canada news? Uh, we are looking at international expansion right now. We will have some announcements around planning for that in due course again early next year. Stay tuned. Love it. Yeah, working with the Canadian regulators is not too fun. So I wouldn't uh, definitely definitely consume a couple of Red Bulls or, uh, or coffees before you get on that call. But Jason, really appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, what a treat, had a blast, and looking forward to round two in a couple months. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Folks, what a great episode with Jason Guthrie from Wisdom Tree Prime, head of product over there, running up everything digital asset related. What a great episode, dropping knowledge bombs left, right, and center. Folks, if you enjoyed this one, and I really hope you did, please do subscribe. It truly means the world to my team and I. And speaking of the team, love you guys. Use us, our amazing sound editor. You're the man. Appreciate you. And to the listeners, love you guys. Keep on growing those bags and keep on staying healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bye for now and we'll talk soon.